this is uh yeah let's talk about how we talk about pitching specs uh or alternatively all about angles almost um because it's not exclusively about angles um uh, yeah, I wanted to talk about uh, like vertical approach angle, horizontal approach angle. Um, these are things that you've probably read in Nick's work and in, in lots of people's work. It's been kind of in vogue the last three years. I think it's kind of like the missing piece in the fastball puzzle, um, a piece that was missing for a long time. Um, and I think people throw it around and they either don't know what they're talking about fully or they people are reading about it and maybe don't understand it um or like have a general concept of it but don't really know like what is good or what's bad and it's more of an interpretation issue so i just kind of wanted to bring it back down to basics um and kind of like reintroduce all these topics um for folks and kind of add some context to all of them because context uh is king in my opinion uh when it comes to baseball analysis like everything's relative um talking in absolutes gets you only so far um, so yeah, let's just dive in. Um, so please know that I've been, uh, yeah, we'll start with apologies. Yeah, it's not, it's not novel research. Um, and I, I've just been putting this presentation together like the last two nights with my, in my spare time. So, uh, basically it's just been a brain dump of information. I'm going to be reading the slides, like basically verbatim. So if you're hearing impaired, if you've got it on mute, cause you're at work and you don't want anyone to know that you're watching. You can totally put this on mute. You're going to get all the same information and you don't have to hear my terrible voice. So, um, yeah, we're going to be talking about the following topics. Um, hopefully I'll get to all of them. I'm wasting a lot of time with preambles, so let's just jump to it. So, uh, yeah, sorry, it's supposed to be smart, but it's not. It's probably bad. Um, so, uh, yeah, so let's start with induced vertical break. So, um, IVB. So this is great because uh, recently, I think like maybe two nights ago at like, midnight 30 o'clock um nick posted something about ivb and then someone made a comment like these are the things that are on your mind at at 12 30 at night uh nick but he was posting about uh whose ivb was it walker bueller's uh ivb ivb um stands for induced vertical break induced vertical break is the vertical movement that happens absent gravity now i'm not a physicist so that might be might not be like the most accurate way to describe it but it's basically um the amount of movement vertically that a pitcher imparts on a pitch so uh if a pitcher was not imparting i guess theoretically if a pitcher was not imparting any induced movement gravity it would just it would just fall the ball would just fall to the floor like that that would just be gravity's effect on the ball so um the pitcher is inducing some amount of movement that's keeping the pitch from falling to the floor um, that is induced vertical break. As you can tell, I'm very smart, uh, very good physics person, um, very good at explaining things. Um, so uh, yeah, naturally IVB uh, induced ver vertical break looks very different by pitch type. And on the right, um, I have split this out by uh, general pitch type. And then I have like a 10th percentile uh, average and 90th percentile um, for each one. So there's actually like pretty disparate ranges of movement by pitch type. Um, and I think you can probably get into arguments that certain pitches are not classified correctly based on their movement profiles. That is entirely a conversation for another day. I, as it says, I am not here to relitigate pitch type classifications. There are people who will argue that such and such pitch is a slider or a sweeper or a cutter or whatever uh, because their movement profile matches an entirely different pitch type. I agree with those folks. I am not here to complain. Um, StatCast assigns their pitch types according to what the pitcher says the pitch is, for better or worse. Uh, it, it just is what it is. So the the 10th and the 9th percentiles can be indicative of elite movement. It can also be indicative of like outlier movement that doesn't really fit the kind of standard criteria for that pitch. So. Um, we have to take those things with a grain of salt. I think four seamers and sinkers are probably the least negotiable. Um, I think the bendy pitches are the ones that probably have a little more, um, you know, wiggle room in definition. But like four seamers, you know what a four seamer is. So those probably have the least amount of variance, I would say, in terms of what the, the movement is. But anyway, I, I present this table because it's good to know like what makes what's average movement what's what's 90th percentile movement what's 12th or what's 10th percentile movement 
for any of these pitches. So when you're talking about it, you see that someone has 16 inches of IVB. Is that good for a four seamer? Is that is that exactly average, um, at least for a righty? So, but as I had mentioned before, and let me get out in front of this. I love Eno. Um, this is not a criticism of Eno that he's here um, in my in my presentation. In fact, he's helping me teach. Excuse me. Um, he tweeted during the um, the posting period for the NPB um, that Naoyuki Uasawa um, hasn't had amazing K rates, but his fastball vertical movement, 19 inches of IVB, see, so we're using lingo here, IVB, um, would be five to top, or top five to 10% in the league. So um, yeah, I love, you know, this is not a criticism, you know, for using 19 inches and percentiles in absolute terms. And he's absolutely right. Like 19 inches of IVB would be at least 90th percentile. I think it's about 93rd percentile in the league. Um, but I do see, and this is not attributing this sentiment to Eno directly, um, but that some people kind of equate more vertical movement to being better as shorthand. And that is not necessarily untrue. Like I don't want to keep, <laughs> I don't want to keep couching all of my statements and hedging everything that I'm saying. Like that could be totally true. That 19 inches of uh, induced vertical break uh, is, is, you know, close to elite, but it's really important to know that in IVB is a function of a uh, vertical release point um, or AKA release height. Um, so there are like physical limitations to what a pitcher can achieve from his arm angle or from his, from his, uh, from his vertical release point. Now I, I have an asterisk down here and I say arm angle and I think it's a it's a really important distinction to make, but we just don't have the data for it. But there's a difference between Randy Johnson throwing sidearm and like me throwing from three quarters. Like that's probably that's probably the same exact release point. But those are two. Randy Johnson's fastball, my fastball. Those are probably the exact same release points, but those are totally different arm angles. So I think pitcher height is really important to consider when we're talking about release points we don't have that data so just when i know when i'm talking about release height and vertical release point it is ultimately like a function of arm angle um but we're just gonna we're just gonna refer to it as we're just gonna pretend that everyone's the same top the same height everyone is six foot one six foot two um and we're, we're talking relative terms so um so anyway ivb is a function of release height and so we can see here in this this image um these are like the distributions of IVBs at each release height. And you can see that there is a gentle, the line is not going through it really at the, the slope that I anticipated based on how I shaped this graph and truncated my axes. But um, you can see that the distribution and kind of like clustering of IVBs within each uh, release point bucket, which is every 0.1 feet, which is close to every inch. But I, yeah, anyway um is has this gentle upward slope so the higher that your your release point is the higher that your release point is the more ivb you can be expected to generate on a fastball all else equal so the lower it is if you're coming from sidearm under ugh, i can't get tall enough underhand tyler rogers um, the less IVB you're expected to create on a fastball, again, all else equal. So that's like holding velocity constant, et cetera. I mean, these ranges that we're showing are capturing all different um, ranges of velocity, um, basically everything. Like all I'm doing here is just taking a distribution or a heat map or whatever you want to call it of, of IVB at each release point. And so, yeah, context is crucial because 19 inches of IVB is is really good but it's not as interesting at a six foot a 6.0 feet release point which would be right here i suppose because i'm six feet tall than it is at you know right here at five and a half feet like people who are throwing from who, who are releasing from five and a half feet and generating 19 inches of ivb that's a lot more interesting and a lot more unique than it is from a much higher release point so this kind of context is really crucial. I have no idea what Uasawa's release points look like. Um, given his lower velocity, I would imagine that he probably does have a lower slot. I've never seen him pitch. I'm not gonna. Um, I'm not gonna like prognosticate 
Um, but if I was evaluating a pitcher and I only had IVB as a data point, I would not feel comfortable evaluating that pitch without knowing more like his release point. And I think, again, all of this is holistic. All these pieces kind of fit together. It's all interwoven. Um, it's really important to take like a holistic view on evaluating pitchers. You really can't just single out certain certain metrics by themselves, um, even if they seem like a, a silver bullet kind of metric, which I feel like vertical approach angle has gotten to that point where it's nearly a silver bullet metric. Um, and, and I think there's validity to that. Um, vertical approach angle for the uninitiated is the vertically oriented angle of a, of a pitch's trajectories across his home plate. So uh, here's, here's the front of home plate, uh, the zone, my hairy arm, and this is the pitch and this angle, that's the angle that the ball's coming down in, that's the approach angle. Um, that's the vertical angle. The horizontal angle would be, you know, related to the the run or cut of the pitch. Um, so a vertical approach angle is kind of a silver bullet metric, but that's because it is the function of a lot of things. It's a function of release point. It's a function of pitch location. It's a function of velocity. It is the function of not just velocity, but the velocity in all three vectors. And so, again, for physics people, that's X, Y, Z. So that's towards home plate towards or away from the batter and, uh, you know, um, longitudinally like north and south um, and acceleration. So like it's taking into account nine and time, like nine different variables to make that a, a calculation. So even though it's just one number and it is a raw measurement uh, of a pitch, it's accounting for so many things within the pitch's flight trajectory that it does kind of become a composite metric of its own that's capturing so much information about the flight path of the pitch. Um, so that's why VAA, I think, has become really kind of prominent in pitching analysis and has proven itself really indispensable is because it is capturing all that information. And it is maybe the one metric that you could use for a pitch, at least for a fastball, that would tell you the most information about its effectiveness in shorthand. I am reluctant to say that you should be doing that. I am just saying if you only had VAA, you could do that. But the problem with VAA, like many other things, is it also lacks context. Um, but before we move on, we can just look at the angles. I'll give you another second to look at all the the, the numbers here to the side. You can see that like a four seamers an average uh, VAA is negative 4.8 degrees. Sinkers negative 5.8 degrees. Curves predictably have the sharpest downward angle of negative 9.7 degrees or nine, negative 9.8 degrees, whether you're a, a lefty or a righty. But predictably, um, VAA uh, is heavily dependent on vertical pitch location. And now I made this really good graphic because I'm amazing. Um, this is a real picture. It's not a stock photo. Um, yeah, honestly, I feel so bad for that guy. That he had to, you know, he's just, uh, he just like wants to do it. He, he just wants to be an actor and they want him to take some stock photos. Um, and uh, he had to go out there and, and pretend like he's throwing a baseball in. Yeah, I deliberately picked a stock photo because I thought it was funny, but now I just feel bad for him. Um, but anyway, these arrows, uh, you know, don't, don't say this to a physicist because we will get into all sorts of arguments, but. Um, these arrows look the same. You know, these are both straight lines. I would say that if you were not a physicist, you would say that these pitches are identical pitches. The only thing that's different um, is where they are thrown. But you can see just visually that the angle at which both of those pitches are coming into the zone uh, are dramatically different. One of them is perfectly flat at the top of the zone, and one of them is much steeper. And so if you were given just a raw VAA measurement of these pitches, you would have no concept of the pitch's shape, if only because you wouldn't know where the pitch was thrown in the zone. Um, where it's thrown in the zone is so, so, so crucial to measuring VAA. Um, and so that's why, oh, okay, yeah, let's, another another example. So let's pretend this is true. These pitches have identical VAAs. and so. Let's pretend that these pitches are coming in at the same angle. You can see that the blue one's very loopy and the red one's very much straighter. 
the 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 kind of the preeminent question is which of these pitches is actually flatter so from a raw vaa measurement we'd say well they're both at negative five degrees based on how they're coming into the zone but i think you can see if you were adjusting for pitch height if you were saying that if the red pitch was thrown to the exact same spot as the blue pitch we would see that it's much flatter than the blue pitch so what that means is if you take a pitch's average VAA, you don't have any idea how flat it actually is because you lose all of that information about pitch location. So what can we do about that? Introducing height adjusted VAA or VAA above average, which is VAAAA or VA. Uh, it took all my energy from this morning to do that. I had to drink two coffees just to get that one out. So. This is kind of like the most basic description of the, the calculation. I'm reluctant to read it. Um, just know that like the idea is kind of what I described in the previous slide and that if if a pitch if all the pitches were thrown at the same locations, which one would be the flattest, which one would be the steepest? It's all relative. So let's remove some of that relativity. Let's add some context to figure out which is flattest kind of regardless of where the pitch is thrown. And so, uh, yeah, Paul Seawald is the poster boy for VAA, AA, 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 AA. The first thing I noticed is that, personally, the first thing that I noticed, aside from the fact that these pit, these um, pitches are all flat, is that flatter fastballs tend to come from lower arm slots with less velocity. So like, if you look at V move, uh, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the seventh column, basically like right in the middle. Um, you can see that like Paul Seawald, Craig Kimbrell, they're throwing from much lower release points. Sorry, let's rewind about one step here. The fifth column, V rel pit, is that that's a vertical release point. You can see that uh, Seawald, Craig Kimbrell, and Alexis Diaz, uh, and Brian Wu for that matter, they all have release points below five feet. So like the average release point is six feet um theirs is a full foot lower they're generating significantly less v move which is the inverse induced vertical break and yet they're creating the flattest planes uh, on their fastballs um one of the reasons why craig kimbrough probably still has a job is that he's able to create such a flat fastball from such a low slot with the velocity that he's still been able to kind of hold on to you can see that he has you know he throws almost four miles per hour harder than paul seawald um, still throwing harder than Alexis Diaz, who's become uh, a, a, you know an elite closer of his own. Um, and Brian Wu, who this is you know effectively Brian Wu propaganda. Um, I won't name names because there's I'm not supposed to be naming names, but uh, there's someone in baseball who's been talking to me about Brian Wu for a long time and, and his fastball being possibly the best fastball in the minors. So um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so he's here now, uh, and it'll be interesting to see what he does in 2024 because that fastball is possibly really good. Um, it has elite VAA above average, so it has elite height-adjusted VAA. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'll see what he does. But really, when I look at this, like I, the only fastballs that I see that have even remotely average or like above average movement, um, Yusei Kikuchi, um, Drew Smith, Alex Vasia. Um, Alex Vasia's fastball is really interesting, but I'm not going to go into each pitch. I could talk about these for hours. So, um, anyway, you can just kind of enjoy that. Um, this is all on the pitch leaderboard. Um, if you don't know who I am, uh, I do a pitch leaderboard. Um, it has Statcast data. This is the leaderboard right here. You can toggle and view all these things um, to your heart's content. Um, so, yeah, you can peruse all that for yourself. I'm not going to do that here. So it's also why it's important to talk about pitch height for VAA because context is king. I've already talked about context being king. It is the truth. So why does VAA AA matter? Well, um, there are lots of ways to slice and dice it, but it's really helpful because you know, in, in looking at the leaderboard, it tells us how many degrees above or below average a pitch is. And so we can say kind of like neutral of location, but also you know, accounting for location. Um, a flatter fastball is likely to induce more whiffs at the top of the zone uh, and also more takes at the bottom of the zone. Um, and conversely, um, a really steep fastball, so we're talking about negative VAAAA, um, will, will accrue more 
takes at the top of the zone and more whiffs at the bottom of the zone. So it's not just about being above average. It's being, you know, below average, quote unquote, below average is not, you know, nominally below average. I think we're talking about distance from zero is what we're really talking about when we're talking about VAA, AA. The farther you are away from zero, the more unusual your fastball shape is. And just kind of in a vacuum, looking at just a few variables in a very crude assessment of these things, you know, the more of an outlier that your fastball has in terms of VAA above average or height adjusted VAA, um, the more extreme outcomes it can produce um, in terms of like whiffs, takes, swings, et cetera. Um, and I will show a, vi a visual later on that kind of like illustrates the the TLDR, as they say, the Spark Notes version of all of this. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's why steeper angles are more important is because you can see, well, I don't know if you can see in the graphic, but what this graphic is trying to show um, is that um, the flatter a pitch is, the more whiffs you get. And the the dark black line here, I don't know if you can see my mouse when I do this, um, is the top of the zone. And you can see that there are more whiffs to be found at the top of the zone for a flatter fastball than there are uh, a steeper fastball. But again, those trends kind of trend downward too to the bottom of the zone. Um, and you can see with sinkers, which is not shown here, um, sinkers have a really nice whiff rate at the bottom and not so much at the top of the zone. Um, and that is not an accident. So uh, again, VAA wrap up. Um, how much time do I have? Uh, I think I have a half hour. Where's my, oh, I got 27 minutes, that's fine. So um, yeah, I should make it abundantly clear that more IVB is not better, um, but also like for VAA, um, flatter is not necessarily better either. Um, I have kind of implied that. I do think that generally that's true. But again, there are lots of things that we need to account for when we're evaluating a pitch. VAA should not be the only one. It can be the only one if you'd like to live dangerously, uh, but it should not be the only one. But it does help explain the anomalies like Paul Sewall, Joe Ryan, um, Alexis Diaz. I don't think I would call him an anomaly um, because that fastball is so, so filthy. But like Joe Ryan, like why, his, why does this fastball work when he's throwing like 92, 93? It's it's the plane of the fastball. It's just the shape of it from his arm slot. Um, and I think we still saw that even though his fastball was really good early in the season, it kind of tapered off toward the end of the season. And I think there's probably still some more digging to be done on flat fastballs that are low velocity fastballs still. Because I think even though the VAA above average masks some of the deficient qualities of a fastball i think there's probably still some merit to there being concerns about an elite angle fastball being too slow or obviously not being located well because location is still really crucial um you don't want to be grooving your fastball um but also like if you're going to be grooving a fastball you better have a sharp like a nice flat or really steep vertical approach angle to help mitigate the ill effects of bad location. So um, like I said, more exaggerated angles tend to produce more exaggerated results. Um, and they, and it definitely, I didn't mention it in the slide, but I just mentioned it now that, you know, those more exaggerated results um, also transpire in the center of the zone where you might make mistakes. Having more exaggerated angles will really help mitigate the mistakes that you make location wise. When I say you, I mean pitchers, because you are not a pitcher. Horizontal approach angle. Oh, my throat. I don't, so I talk like my job. I work like, you know, eight hours a day, five days a week. I'm on like one call a week. I'm at home by myself all day with cats. I'm almost never talking. I've, all, I've already talked more today in the, the last 30 minutes than I have probably all week. So forgive me as I lubricate my throat here. Horizontal approach angle is, uh, yeah, it's the horizontally oriented angle of a pitch's trajectory as it crosses home plate. You'd never believe that, um, but I'm just gonna I'm just gonna jump right to brass tacks. The really important question: Should we even care? That's a great question. Um, you know, I posted a whole post about this on Fangraphs, and yes, you should care a little bit about HAA. Um, again, the, the table to the right shows us what the 
um, the, the horizontal approach angles typically are um, for a variety of pitches. Um, the order is different um, because it's sorted by the, the sharpest angle um, average. So you're seeing sharper angles for slurves and sweepers and sliders predictably um, horizontally and, and less so for for so for, uh, for, fa uh, for oh my gosh for fastballs excuse me um so the order is different and I apologize for that that's just sorted by the average it wasn't sorted by pitch type so the order is all jumbled compared to VAA um but you can see that like the pitches that you'd expect to have sharper lateral or horizontal angles are your you know your 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 breaking pitches excuse me so should we even care great question um yeah taxonomy so um you know sharpness of break can help us distinguish among pitches with nebulous labels like slider and sweeper so i do think that's important although again i'm not here to relitigate pitch names and pitch types that's that conversation could go on forever um you're never going to find a consensus because there's people who think you should again i you know, i don't know i said i wasn't going to talk about it here i'm talking about it, so just let's move on um but uh you know Finding sharpness of break is not a novel breakthrough from HAA. Um, there's other metrics like velocity and horizontal movement that help us with that. So like HAA is not necessarily adding a lot of extra information in that regard. Um, and uh, in terms of like pitch analysis, I haven't found it to be particularly useful, um, frankly, but it, it can still be useful. Um, it's twice as complicated and half as fun. So here's another really good graphic. Um, I was able to find a picture, um, an overhead view of a picture on stock photos. Um, I'm just kidding. I had to, I just rotated it. It's really bad. I, I actually, I should apologize. It's so bad. Um, just that, just like VAA is um, dependent on vertical location, horizontal approach angle is dependent on horizontal location, but it is more complicated than that because it is also dependent on the release point and the release point, unlike vertical release point, the horizontal release point can change. So like vertical release point, I am always probably gonna release it from right here, unless I chose to do something different, of course, but presumably my arm, like my mechanics, um, will always have me releasing the ball from here. The only way I would release from here or here without meaningfully changing everything about my pitch is if I stood on a crate or I dug a hole, so presumably my vertical release points are going to be pretty consistent, but horizontally, you know, the mound is, I actually don't know how wide the rubber is. And I should probably know that, but like what, two feet wide. So the difference between vertical release points without changing my arm mechanics at all can be two feet. And I think there's a Paul Skeens, is that how you pronounce his last name? Skeens? I've never said it out loud. Skeens, Paul Skeens. There's a big thing about Paul Skeens. Maybe it's not a big thing. But uh, he has like the widest variation in his re his horizontal release point. And that's because depending on the handedness of the hitter, he either stands on the first base side or he stands on the third base side. And so fundamentally, nothing is changing about his pitch except for the horizontal release point. But it does change how the fastball is perceived from the hitter's standpoint. Um, it does, in effect, change the quote unquote shape of it, even though the pitch is the same pitch that he's throwing to lefties and righties where he's throwing it from changes kind of the trajectory of where it's going based on where he's locating it within the zone. So in this first image on the slide, I have the same pitch to the same, I have the same pitch from the same location to different pitch locations. And you can see that as it crosses home plate, they are going in at different angles. And then in this, just at the bottom, I'm so sorry. Graphic design is my passion. Um, the, uh, this is also the same pitch to the same location from different release points. So this is the Paul Skeens, you know, conundrum is that he's throwing from different sides of the rubber to, uh, you know, the inner half of a, on a lefty. And you can see that the angle is going to come in differently based on where he's standing on the rubber. Um, so that's really important, um, in accounting for horizontal approach angles is that you need to account for the horizontal release point too, unlike the. Um, the vertical release point for um, VAA. Uh, and then there's also the pitcher's handedness too, because unlike VAA, which is only going north to south, 
you know, cut and ride for lefties and righties are going to be flipped. So now you're controlling for like three different variables, variables, at least three different variables. Um, Kyle Bland, who is a genius, he works for pitch, um, pitcher list. Um, he does like some of the best visuals ever. Um, really smart. I think he might probably calculate HAA differently. He might calculate VAA differently. That's fine. There's different ways you can do it. Um, so I'm not saying that this is like the only way you can do it. These are just things that you need to consider when you're looking at HAA, horizontal approach angle is the location, the release point, and the handedness. So dealing with lots of things. But you can do the same thing with horizontal approach angle that like you can with VAA. You can adjust it for all those things, and you can normalize it. And we can get pluses and minuses. We can get distance from average. And we can kind of come to the same conclusions, which is that basically sharper angles toward the hitter on the inner edge or away from the hitter on the outer edge um, produce more whiffs. And sharper angles, hold on, let me, <laughs> sharper angles away from the hitter on the inner edge and toward the hitter on the outer edge will induce more whiffs. And that's just a product of the more exaggerated outcomes, or sorry, the more exaggerated angles creating more exaggerated outcomes. Now it's not, again, for like the millionth time, this is not foolproof. Um, it should not be interpreted in a vacuum, um, but it is indicative of these qualities. It does not guarantee these qualities this is just talking about like the average pitcher throwing this kind of pitch with this particular approach angle quality well let's condense our knowledge about approach angles because i've talked about coming in to the zone going out of the zone and really what it boils down to is that yeah graphic design is my passion um is that sharper angles out of the zone are better for whiffs and sharper sharper angles toward the zone are better for called strikes and that to me is like really intuitive like if a pitch looks like it's going to miss just narrowly outside the zone and then cuts back in at the last second at a sharp angle it's going to induce more called strikes because it gives off the illusion of being uh, a bad pitch that becomes a good pitch and conversely pitches that are angled sharply uh, you know, on the edge and sharply angled sharply out of the zone, they look like they're going to be good pitches that end up being bad pitches. They're going to end up inducing more swinging strikes or at least more swings. But with swings come typically come swinging strikes, especially when you're talking about the edge of the zone um, where swinging strike rates or where contact rates are going to be lower than in the heart of the zone. So um, that's like the that's like the gist of it. That's the it's, it's as simple as that, really. Um, you can talk all you want about all the complexities of VAA and HAA, but really like the more exaggerated your angles are at the edge of the zone, depending on which way it's exaggerated, that's gonna induce, you know, the 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 associated outcome with like the directionality of the angle sharpness. So um, I think that's cool. I think that's cool. I think it's pretty intuitive. I think that's like something that we all know, but just didn't have words for, um, <laughs> excuse me. Um, but, uh, but let's, uh, let's talk about the heart of the zone now, because I was talking about the edges of the zone and, you know, the edges of the zone are where VAA and HAA are really going to play up. Um, so like, that's where, you know, Garrett Cole lives with his fastball at the top of the zone. Um, you know, Aaron Nola, I just reposted something on Twitter and I don't expect you to follow me on Twitter, but maybe you saw the video of of Aaron Nola locating a sinker on the inner half to a lefty, so glove side, um, and getting a called strike. Like that's that fits this this kind of like you know framework to a T. Um, locating right here, glove side with run, so it's angling back in toward the zone and catching that hitter off guard because it looks like it's going to be off the inner half of the zone and then it cuts back in that's going to get you more called strikes, generally speaking, um, you know, relatively speaking. So, um, so uh, yeah, all these things are important and, and, you know, location is so, so crucial to making these things work. 
Um, these things can still work in the heart of the zone, but VAA plays up much better than it does than HAA does in in the heart of the zone. And and I think that's probably also intuitive. But if I have to explain it again, I made a really 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 good graphic um, in which. Uh, you know, I think if you're just thinking about it in terms of a one inch miss, so let's let's consider a swing that has an extremely small margin for error. Um, if you miss one inch off a pitch in either direction, you you run the risk of missing the pitch altogether if we're talking about a miss that's vertically oriented. So uh, so if a pitch has a stronger vertical approach angle, it's more likely to create mistakes along the vertical axis and so if a swing is off by an inch we're not talking about bad contact we're talking about no contact entirely you know we're talking about the difference between whiffs and making contact whereas uh if we're talking about a mistake that's made laterally east or west um a one inch miss we're talking about uh the difference between barreling it up or getting sawed off and while I think getting sawed off is probably an ideal outcome for a pitcher. Um, generally speaking, like you probably want whiffs more than contact. Um, and I think that's why we see it bear out in the data that sharper VAAs will play up kind of regardless of zone. You can see a pitch like Jacob deGrom's fastball, middle, middle at 101 is unhittable. Um, and that's because of its shape. That's because of its approach angle and velocity. But again, the approach angle is determined by the velocity, <laughs> among other things. So uh, you can make those mistakes with a really flat fastball or perhaps like a really steep fastball. Um, but you can't really make those mistakes with like a really sharp uh, horizontal approach angle type pitch. Um, and... Uh, you know, it's not to say that like horizontal approach angle doesn't matter, but it's just much more locationally dependent, which kind of begs a much larger discussion about what constitutes stuff versus command. And I know I don't want to talk about it here. I keep saying things like that. Um, there's a big, I, I shouldn't say there's a big argument, but there's like people who think stuff matters more than command. I think the data has shown really that stuff is better at predicting future performance. Um, but command is invariably much more indicative of what actually happens, which is such a hard thing for people to wrap around, wrap their heads around. Um, so location location is important and it's especially important for horizontal approach angle. And that again, kind of begs the question like chicken or egg, like does HAA, like does a sharp horizontal approach angle count as stuff if it needs location? That's a great question. Uh, vertical approach angle doesn't really have that issue again because it can be kind of thrown anywhere in the zone um, and play up more than like a dead red fastball that has no special angular qualities but for HAA like being on the edge of the zone is really crucial um, so if you're gonna be a sinker a sinker baller a two seam pitcher um, you're gonna want to have better command than your four seam counterparts um and I think we see that with like Aaron Nola and Sandy Alcantara. Um, and like, I think Julio Urias probably, he throws a sinker. I don't know. It's been a while since I've looked at guys who throw sinkers. I, I'm just, Zach Wheeler, great example too. You know, guys who like definitely have plus command who are throwing sinkers, like that's not that's not a, a mistake. You know, that's not an accident. So um, anyway, <clears throat> enough about that. Let's talk about release angles. I've got a few more minutes. Um, I'm going to get Nick back on schedule so the next group can start right at uh, 4 p.m. if they want to, or is it 3 p.m.? Um, uh, yeah, let's talk about the uh, release, ang release angles. Uh, not the Los Angeles angles, um, but a release angles. So not a lot of people talk about release angles, probably because that data is hard to come by. In fact, I don't know any place that provides release angles. So um, it is going to be on the pitch leaderboard starting in February. I'm not here to plug the pitch leaderboard, but uh, yeah, it will be there in case that's something you want to look at. So um, I'm not going to go too in depth on release angles. Um, I, this is what I wanted to do some novel research on. I just didn't have time. I truthfully don't think there's a ton there to uncover that isn't already uncovered by VAA, HAA, 
induced vertical break horizontal movement. And that's because, uh, you know, release angle is kind of already highly correlated with those things. Like VAA and HAA, those things are correlated with location. Um, and location is a product of the angle that the ball is released from, from a pitcher's hand. So location and release angle in in conjunction with velocity and induced vertical break are going to explain so much of release angle that it's possible that you don't need it. I'm not going to make that declaration because I think over time, as I'm looking at it, I'm sure things will bubble up. Smarter people than me will use release angle. They'll find some trends. They'll do some really cool things with release angle. I think there's probably some cool research to be done on tunneling with release angle. Um, if if folks have it, I know release or uh, I know tunneling is kind of a nebulous topic. There's been some really good research on tunneling to date, but the definition of tunneling is kind of a moving target. The people who are trying to define tunneling are finding different things about tunneling. So I think having release angle data will be helpful in providing some clarity in that field of uh, release angle. Sorry, I've got a thing on my camera there. Um, in terms of kind of lending some some insight and clarity into the research that's related to tunneling. So that's something that I would like to look into, but since I apparently never have time to do anything, I probably won't. So uh, like pitch location, VRA is dependent on pitch, or uh, like VAA, excuse me, um, VRA is dependent on pitch location. Um, and like I said before, like they're so, it's so correlated with, IVB and VAA that you could probably just reverse engineer VRA um, pretty easily with just those two things. Obviously, you, you would like to have some more information to just build out the whole trajectory of the pitch path. But if you only had two data points, you could probably figure out the third one being VRA. Um, uh, yeah, but there's just substantial multicollinearity. That just means all these variables are correlated very strongly with one another. And that's because they're all kind of using the same information in terms of measurements. So I, I'm not really sure that adding like vertical release angle or horizontal release angle will bolster pitching analysis that much, will really improve pitch models. Um, you know, nevertheless, let's look at it. Um, so visually and extremely poorly, like these are all the different components of a pitch basically at this point. We're talking about the release angle on the left. Um, the red line is the movement with gravity. Um, on the right, the angle at which it approaches home plate, that's the approach angle. The blue line is is not visible. Um, I shouldn't say it's invisible because you do see the pitch, but you don't see necessarily like the two competing forces of gravity and induced vertical break happening against each other. So the blue line is just kind of capturing the idea of the pitcher imparting um, forces against gravity on the pitch. It's creating rise, so to speak. It's creating carry, whatever you want to call it, ride, um, all sorts of different names for IVB. Um, so this is just a quick visual, and I, I hope that's helpful. Um, but uh, again, the vertical angel angle, why well, I said angel, Los Angeles angels, the vertical angle at which a pitch is released is uh, the vertical release angle. Um, uh, and I, I suppose you might expect that a pitcher would endeavor to conceal the initial shape of his pitch by making his release angles uniform i think as you can see um for the average pitcher you just generally don't have that consistent of angles i would argue that like the difference of two or two and a half degrees is like so minuscule that really you can't tell but also i'm not a professional hitter and maybe two and a half degrees is all it takes to tell that like two pitches are just fundamentally different so um there is probably some pitch tipping involved with um, release angles. Um, they are pretty different, but I think you, you might notice that there could be what you call tunneling opportunities. So like change-ups, cutters, sinkers, splitters, they all have really consistent um, release angles, which I find really interesting. So, um, you know, I do think like you could maybe build uh, an arsenal or a repertoire around an array of pitches that have similar release angles that might make, um, that might make locating those pitches easier. It might make designing those pitches easier i wouldn't know because i'm not a pitch design expert or a pitch coach um but again i'm not sure there's any merit to vras being tight like from a from an arsenal standpoint there's no distinct trend that i found in looking at um 
276 pitchers who threw at least a thousand pitches in 2023. There was basically no trend. Um, now that doesn't control for like the types of pitches being thrown or the pitch location, et cetera. Um, as I've noted, like each pitch type has kind of different inherent release angle traits to them and again we're not controlling for pitch location and that's super important because if i was just throwing a ball sky its release angle would be like 90 degrees but the location is horrible um so if you're locating at the top of the zone that might be a release angle of zero and if you're looking at the bottom of the zone maybe it's like a release angle of negative five or something you know so um pitch location is really important location is always important context is king um, but as I think about this right now, maybe we can easily control for location. So let's do that. And I did that last night and I was like, well, it's just zeros. Uh, I, you know, maybe there's something there. I mean, it's supposed to be centered around zero, you know, that's kind of the point. Um, but like, uh, you know, just looking at this as it stands, I didn't really learn a lot. I need to plot it, I think. Um, and maybe, maybe, you know, fool around with it a little bit more to figure out if there's anything there. Um, I do think it's really interesting. There's a lot more variance um, among the average release angles for lefties than there is righties. When you're looking at like splitters, cutters, sweepers, that might be just kind of a sample issue. Like, I don't know how many lefties are throwing splitters, um, but there should be plenty throwing sweepers and cutters. So it does beg the question, although I don't know what question it begs. That's just the thing that people say when a question is begged. So. Um, but I think, you know, if a, if a pitcher weaponizes pitches effectively north to south, he can he can mask the differences in VRA too, right? So, you you know, if you're if you're tunneling it in a way that your pitches appear the same out of hand, but are going to different places in the zone, which is effectively what pitching is, um, then I think you can probably mask some of those issues and you can probably expose some of your issues with really bad release angles. But again, I haven't done the research and hoping someone once they have their hands on the data, we'll do that. Uh, and horizontal approach angle is the angle at which a pitch is released horizontally. Um, unsurprisingly, pitchers with more run on their pitches will have sharper... Pitches with more run have sharper HRAs. You know, I don't think I meant that. I wrote that last night at 11.30. Um, I don't think that's necessarily true. I was thinking of, of horizontal approach angle. Um so I don't think there's actually necessarily any merit to like what would beget a, a, a steeper or sharper release angle um, horizontally. I think maybe location is important, obviously, but like a pitch with more run or more cut should not necessarily be thrown a different way unless you're throwing like Adam Adovino's Frisbee slider. Like maybe you need to like really tweak your release angle to make that thing work. But um so yeah, uh, I adjusted this one too, and like straight up just zeros. Like I don't know if that's helpful at all. So um, yeah, location adjustment uh, and, and the same adjustments that I make for HAA to so HRA looks really not helpful. Um, so that's something that we just got to work on. But you know, I just want to kind of get uh, people familiarized with uh, release angles that they exist, um, that they'll be on the pitch leaderboard. That I expect some smart people to take that data and run with it. Um, yeah, I think there's use cases for re release angles, but I don't know what they are yet. I think like the best thing that you can use it for right now is tunneling. I'm not sure tightness is something that we want to look at. Um, it could be though. It could be. I think maybe the the location adjusted vertical release point has some promise. There's a lot more um, variance there, um, and you might be able to figure out. Um, you know, you might be able to uncover something. So um, thanks, thanks for letting me ramble. Um, I actually made it to, wow, I finished before three o'clock. So that's great, Nick. You don't have to ask me any questions, but I, I will say I am disappointed. It doesn't seem like we made it to 10,000. So um, obviously people didn't want to see uh, see my shirt come off and that's fine. You know, we can't, we can't all, we can't win them all. So, um, but thank you everyone for listening. Um, thank you everyone for kind of allowing me to just stumble through this. Um, please donate. Let's get to 10,000. Let's get to, let's, let's, Let's get to 16,000. I was just trying to do like a projection. Um, and uh, yeah, if you need to find me, I'm on Twitter at Dolph Haldhagen. <laughs> uh, and soon, that's it.